Hey everyone, welcome back to all my listeners. Hope you're all having a great day so far. And if it's your first time finding me, thanks so much and welcome. Welcome to episode 17 of my third season. Today is Wednesday, August 25th, 2021. My name is Sonal Patel and this is the Paint the Medical Picture podcast series. Now I wanted to thank all my fabulous guests these past seasons. These folks have made an impact in my opinion, and I'm happy all of their amazing stories, their insights, and their journeys are appreciated by all of you, my listeners. So I'm continuously humbled and ever so grateful that this podcast has made it already into the top 50 during my podcast's first year. That's right, in the top 50 Apple podcast charts, Paint the Medical Picture podcast has recently ranked at number 30. That's my highest ever in the U.S. I'm also in the top Canadian and Philippine charts as well. I also cannot believe, again, this has been my first full year of podcasting as of today. It's been 52 episodes that I've developed and curated into three amazing seasons with all my outstanding guests, all those healthcare attorneys, physicians, medical coders, auditors, entrepreneurs and educators, and healthcare compliance professionals. Now, I hope you'll keep giving me all your kind feedback and support so I can keep going strong into my second year of podcasting and I can begin season four. So thanks to all of you for your continued downloads and keep those kind reviews coming in and all those five-star ratings as well. Now, in my compliance tip today, I'm going to be diving in once again into Modifier 25 with all the hullabaloo in recent OIG work plans, as well as the everyday work I perform. I think there's no harm in emphasizing it again. And I also discuss highlights from the month of August's criminal and civil enforcement cases involving fraud, waste, and abuse. And I round out today's episode with a remarkable quote on journeys from our beloved 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. If you've checked me out on LinkedIn, you know I'm all about compliance and protecting our physicians and valued healthcare professionals when it comes to the business of medicine. I hope this week with me brings you enough to take back to your organizations, to want to dive in deeper, to use my tips and best practices to ensure success. I hope this podcast will help you boost the quality of documentation capture and improve coding accuracy as you help your providers paint the medical picture. If you like what you're hearing, go ahead and hit that subscribe button now so you don't miss another episode. Please write in a review and kindly drop me a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to my podcast. I'd really love your support. And as always, a friendly disclaimer. Remember, I am bringing you the news, current healthcare industry news, my compliance tips and recommendations based on my over 10 years of experience in front office, back end, coding, and billing for multi-specialty physicians, compliance, and auditing for both ENM and surgical operative reports. These are my opinions alone and are not to be construed as legal advice. So let's get into newsworthy, the month's fraud, waste, and abuse cases. The month of August saw 28 cases as of the recording of this episode. Early August saw, at one point in time, the nation's largest Medicare mail-order diabetic testing supplier and its parent company, who have agreed to pay $160 million to resolve allegations that they violated the False Claims Act. This settlement resolves allegations that the supplier and parent company created claims to Medicare that were false because of three things. Number one, kickbacks were paid to Medicare patients. Second, some of these patients were ineligible to receive the meters. And third, some patients were deceased. Now, early August also saw a medical center and county who have agreed to pay approximately $11.4 million to resolve alleged violations of the False Claims Act for submitting or causing the submission of claims to Medicare for non-covered inpatient admissions. 
Now, remember, Medicare reimburses only for services that are reasonable and medically necessary for the diagnosis or treatment of illness or injury. Now, the United States alleged that from January 1st of 2013 through February 28th of 2017, the medical center and the county admitted certain patients for whom inpatient care was not medically reasonable nor medically necessary, including patients who were admitted for reasons other than their medical status, including for social reasons and lack of available alternative placements. Now, the medical center and county billed Medicare for such patients despite their knowledge that the costs for admitting them were not reimbursable by Medicare. Now, mid-August saw, in my opinion, a very disturbing case in Florida. Now, an attorney general of a Medicaid fraud control unit, a Mifuku, with the assistance of a county sheriff's office, as well as a police department, announced the arrests of three registered nurses for aggravated abuse and neglect of a disabled adult. Now, this attorney general states, quote, this trio was trusted to provide care to a patient suffering from a serious health condition. Instead of acting in the best interest of the patient, they disobeyed hospital policy and established medical procedure. Because of their actions, the patient suffered a new set of medical issues requiring multiple surgeries. Thanks to the work of my Medicaid Fraud Control Unit and local law enforcement, these caregivers will be held accountable for their neglect and abuse. We will not tolerate abuse of our seniors in Florida. End quote. Now, according to the investigation, these three worked as registered nurses for a long-term care hospital in Florida. Now, in September of 2019, the three provided care to a disabled adult suffering from hypothermia. Now, against hospital policy and established medical procedure, they applied ice bags filled with hot water, allegedly from a coffee maker with a hot water dispenser to the disabled adult's body in an attempt to counter the patient's hypothermia. The disabled adult was then left alone for at least two hours before another employee discovered that the victim sustained several third degree burns. As a result, the patient required transportation to a larger medical center to undergo several skin graft surgeries. They each face one count of aggravated abuse of a disabled adult, which is a first-degree felony, and neglect of a disabled adult, which is a second-degree felony. Now, if convicted, each face up to 45 years in prison and up to $20,000 in fines. Now, mid-August also saw a hospitalist group who has agreed to pay a total of $200,000 plus interest to resolve alleged violations of the False Claims Act by overbilling Medicare for Advanced Care Planning Services, or ACP services, as well as Tobacco Cessation Counseling Services, or TCC services. Now, in many instances, the hospitalist group sought Medicare reimbursement for ACP and TCC services regardless of whether the counseling was necessary, voluntary, or performed with patient consent. The settlement resolves allegations that between January and September of 2019, the hospitalist group engaged in a coordinated effort to defraud the United States by pressuring their personnel to seek Medicare reimbursement for advanced care planning services and tobacco cessation counseling services for patients they treated regardless of medical need. In most cases, the prerequisites for ACP and TCC services were not met, and not every patient required the services that were billed. In some instances, the hospitalist group allegedly billed Medicare four or more times where ACP services were provided to a single patient over a short time frame with no evidence of any documented changes in patient condition to justify its billing activities.
They also allegedly unnecessarily sought and received Medicare reimbursement for tobacco cessation counseling where patients did not use tobacco. There were also many of the usual suspects like opioids distributors, kickbacks, bribery schemes, fraudulent DME billing, and money laundering. But I'd like to highlight two cases that I find most interesting. First, this case involves a pain management organization who's agreed to pay and settle criminal Medicare kickback violations in the amount of $5.1 million. Now, as a part of a non-prosecution agreement resolving criminal liability, the pain management organization admitted that it and its affiliate entered into an arrangement with a now defunct genetics testing company formerly based in California, in which the testing company unlawfully compensated physicians under the guise of a clinical research program. Now, the federal anti-kickback statute, the AKS, provides for criminal penalties for whoever knowingly and willfully offers, pays, solicits, or receives remuneration to induce or reward the referral of business that is reimbursable under any of the federal health care programs, including Medicare. The statute covers the payers of kickbacks, those who offer or pay remuneration, as well as the recipients of kickbacks, those who solicit or receive remuneration. The organization admitted that certain physicians referred to the clinical research payments offered by the testing company as being payments per test or per patient, and that as a part of the scheme, physicians completed timesheets used by the testing company to pay the physicians which overstated the time that the physicians spent conducting the quote-unquote related clinical research. In some cases, the timesheets indicated that the physicians had performed certain tasks which had in fact already been performed by the testing company's own employees, resulting in payments from the testing company to the physicians for tasks they did not even perform. Now, the pain management organization admitted that certain personnel communicated to the testing company that they would not offer the testing company's genetic tests at additional pain management site locations unless they were current on their payments to physicians. Now, at the time, the testing company communicated to the pain management organization that they also expected something from the physicians. They expected the physicians to order a certain volume of tests from them. And apparently, these genetic tests purportedly could determine a patient's risk of abusing certain prescription opioids and how patients metabolized certain drugs. The physicians received a total of $1.1 million in payments from the genetics testing company. Medicare paid the testing company approximately $4 million for claims they submitted based on the referrals from the pain management organization's physicians. Now, the second case involves a registered nurse and nurse practitioner who allegedly billed and received more than $2.3 million from commercial health insurers and Medicaid for services he falsely claimed to have performed on patients in Rhode Island, New York, and Florida. Now, it's alleged in an indictment returned by a federal grand jury that this nurse routinely submitted claims for health insurance payments for in-person patient services he claimed to have performed in New York and Florida, but that investigators determined were at times when he was actually in another state or out of the country. Now, in other instances, he allegedly billed insurance companies and Medicare for services he claimed to have provided to patients who themselves were out of state or out of country at the time. Now, it's also alleged in the indictment that, is, that as a part of the scheme, the nurse waived copayments for some Medicare patients despite being aware that waiving copayments is prohibited by Medicare. By waiving copayments they otherwise would be responsible for, he then and therefore induced his patients not to report his fraudulent billing to Medicare. And according to information presented to the court, 
no patient services were provided at the nurse's New York or Rhode Island business. In fact, neither office location is allegedly equipped to provide patient care. It's further alleged that the nurse rented and used the New York office space in name only for billing purposes and to receive insurance payments made payable to his Rhode Island business location. Now, the indictment alleges that since February of 2014 in Rhode Island, New York, and Florida, as well as elsewhere, this nurse fraudulently billed and received approximately just about $2.4 million from commercial health insurers and Medicare for services he did not provide to patients. The indictment charges him with health care fraud, eight counts of mail fraud, and money laundering. Oh my goodness. Wow. Right? That's unbelievable. So how can I end the showcase pieces this month on just two when there's a third case that is just begging to also be in the spotlight? And it, of course, involves COVID-19. Now, there's a licensed pharmacist who was arrested in Illinois on charges related to his alleged sale of dozens of authentic Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, that's our CDC, COVID-19 vaccination cards on eBay. Now, according to court documents, in March and April of 2021, this pharmacist sold 125 authentic CDC vaccination cards to 11 different buyers for approximately $10 per card. Now, he was a licensed pharmacist in Illinois, and he was employed at a pharmacy at the time, which distributed and administered COVID-19 vaccines at its physical locations nationwide. Now, as required by the CDC, this pharmacy provided a CDC vaccination record card to each vaccine recipient. Now, like I stated, he worked as a pharmacist at the pharmacy during that time, and he obtained and subsequently offered authentic CDC vaccination cards for sale online. The indictment charges him with 12 counts of theft of government property. Now, the Assistant Attorney General of the Justice Department's Criminal Division has stated, quote, we take seriously and will vigorously investigate any criminal offense that contributes to the distrust around vaccines and vaccination status. End quote. He later goes on and says, quote, the Department of Justice and its law enforcement partners are committed to protecting the American people from these offenses during this national emergency. End quote. Now, there's a special agent in charge at the FBI Fieldhouse who has stated, quote, knowingly selling COVID-19 vaccination cards to unvaccinated individuals puts millions of Americans at risk or serious injury or death, end quote. He further stated, quote, to put such a small price on the safety of our nation is not only an insult to those who are doing their part in the fight to stop COVID-19, but a federal crime with serious consequences, end quote. And finally, another special agent in charge at the HHS OIG stated, quote, Stealing and selling COVID-19 vaccination cards is inexcusable and will not be tolerated, end quote. He goes on and says, quote, fraudsters who engage in such unlawful conduct undermine efforts to address the pandemic and profit at the public's expense. The health and safety of the public is our top priority, and we encourage people to obtain vaccination cards from their administering medical providers. End quote. Simply unbelievable. Unbelievable stuff this month of August. So, in my opinion, the month of August revealed more madness, more mayhem with fraudsters of all types, all shapes, all sizes. I do my very best each month trying to highlight those cases I find most interesting. So many are similar to cases I've worked on or I'm currently working on in my auditing and compliance work. I try my best to provide solid guidance and advice to providers to be mindful 
of correct coding and compliant billing practices to avoid joining these very serious, these very public and very egregious outcomes. I always believe these types of fraud, waste, and abuse cases are most helpful. Take a deeper look into these reports and see how they may affect you, your provider, your facility. Start self-auditing your service claims and coordinating documentation to ensure you are meeting compliance. And now, it's time for my best practice tips. In trusty tip. I know I've already gone over this hot topic before, but you know what? I know there still continues to be widespread confusion and misunderstanding with how to use modifier 25 correctly to use it compliantly in the documentation I've seen over the years. Now, I know I've already highlighted the most recent OIG work plan from April 2021 that sets its crosshairs on dermatology practices misusing Modifier 25. But did you know it's been on the OIG work plans off and on since 2005? That's 15 years since they first came out with an educational piece titled Use of Modifier 25. It really was the first random claims audit of 450 claims in calendar year 2002 using Modifier 25. Unfortunately, upsetting as this is to me, I can and do agree and see that this continued confusion and misunderstanding can be considered abuse to the Medicare program. So let me try and sh shine some light on how, how to be compliant with Modifier 25. First, it's categorized as a payment modifier. And by the brief definition in the very front of the CPT book, right behind the cover page, it is defined as, quote, significant, separately identifiable evaluation and management ENM service by the same physician on the same day of the procedure or other service, end quote. Now, that brief definition itself is what causes the confusion, in my opinion. You really need to know your coding book. Now, Appendix A discusses modifiers in so many CPT coding books over the years, but I'm looking at 2021 right now. It states, quote, it may be necessary to indicate that on the day a procedure or service identified by a CPT code was performed, the patient's condition required a significant, separately identifiable ENM service above and beyond the other service provided, or above and beyond the usual preoperative and postoperative care associated with the procedure that was performed, end quote. So what does that mean? That means the medical documentation must show the provider performed extra work, extra E&M work above and beyond the usual work required for the other service or procedure on the same date. I always advise that your documentation for the ENM should stand apart from the other service or procedure. It should be able to stand alone as its own unique service. There should also always be medical necessity for both the ENM and the minor procedure or service. So that doesn't necessarily mean the diagnoses need to be different. The National Correct Coding Initiative, the NCCI policy manual, states this fact. But different does signify separate and distinct from the minor procedure or service. But always remember the diagnoses must support what is in the medical documentation. Now, when you interpret the same physician requirement portion of the definition correctly, certified medical coders must remember that Medicare follows this rule found in Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 12, Section 30.6.5, that states, quote, physicians in the same group practice who are in the same specialty must bill and be paid as though they were a single physician. 
if more than one evaluation and management face-to-face -face service is provided on the same day to the same patient by the same physician or more than one physician in the same specialty in the same group, only one evaluation and management service may be reported unless the evaluation and management services are for unrelated problems. Instead of billing separately, the physicians should select a level of service representative of the combined visits and submit the appropriate code for that level." End quote. So, in a nutshell, for coding purposes, all physicians who bill under the same NPI number even those sharing one in a group practice are considered to be the same physician. Also, remember, Modifier 25 is only appended to the ENM code, not on the separate and minor procedure. And again, don't forget that separate and minor procedure has global days of 0 or 10. Now, remember, that NCCI manual when in doubt, always review it. Verify any and all edits at play before you submit a claim with Modifier 25. I reread my NCCI manual at least once a year to stay fresh. Now, here's a good example of when to use Modifier 25 based on a scenario in the Medicare and Medicaid NCCI manuals, Chapter 1, Section D. And it's also in the Medicare Claims Processing Manual, Chapter 12, Section 40.1.C. And it goes on to say that if a physician sees a new patient with head trauma and decides the patient needs sutures, and after confirming allergy and immunization status, and after obtaining informed consent, the physician then performs the repair procedure. And ENM is not separately reportable in this scenario here. But if the physician performs a medically necessary full neurological examination for the head trauma patient, then reporting a separate ENM with modifier 25 appended may be appropriate. Remember, the decision to perform the minor procedure or service is included in the payment for the minor procedure and it cannot be separately reportable. Our scenario I just said above is not for the decision, and it does require a lot more significant workup, much more significant separate documentation too. So these facts are a very good reminder that you should be taking advantage of all the resources and tools that are out there and making checklists and improving workflows and efficiencies at your practice to ensure all documentation is being captured. Coding and billing are compliant for all applicable statutory and regulatory guidelines. Remember, the OIG audits have shown Modifier 25 on their hit list for years. Remember, the OIG work plan has recently reflected a shiny new target I disclosed a few months back for dermatology practices now billing many minor procedures with a same day ENM with modifier 25. Are those ENMs really separate and distinct? We will have to wait and see. But the much earlier reports with findings have been going on and on and have been available for us to review for many years. So we must do better. We must be mindful that our provider's clinical documentation is capturing complete accuracy of the patient's medical condition. If the documentation supports it, Modifier 25 can be easily, handily defended, and the monies can be retained. So, a better, smarter approach is one that's proactive and starts by painting a clear, rich, and vibrant medical picture the first time so your certified medical coder can then abstract codes with accuracy. And finally, in this week's inspiring quote in Spark is from our great American president, Abraham Lincoln. Give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. 
absolutely true, right? I think this is a perfect quote that reminds us, inspires us on the preparation involved in our journeys. We have all started our journeys with small steps through education, through listening and learning and doing. We've all taken a few weeks, a few months, a few years in each of our many journeys. At the end of each one, we gain the clarity, the wisdom of lessons learned. We can take those lessons learned, that wisdom, and apply it again for our next big adventure. We can remember Honest Abe's wise words on the preparation it takes to allow our journeys to begin. I'm happy Abraham Lincoln's spark still shines on in all of us today. So that wraps up today's episode. Please go out and make this a great day, an incredible week for yourselves. Aim a little higher, do a little more, and give back in any way you can in 2021. There's so much each one of us can do. And my final note for season three, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine just received its full FDA approval as I'm recording this episode. So I hope more and more of us go out and get fully vaccinated. Now, this new Delta variant in the COVID-19 surge is spreading pretty aggressively in states nationwide and of course across the world. So please try and stay vigilant. I know it's hard. I know we're all so very tired of this new normal, but let's do our part and keep washing up masking up, and staying physically distant. As always, I appreciate you diving into today with me. And if you want more information from me, go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. I'll leave links to everything in the show notes below. Please continue staying safe and healthy, practice safety for one and all during our collective seemingly never ever ending life and times of coronavirus. Thank you so much for listening in on today's episode. And I hope every week with me brings you closer to helping your providers paint a masterpiece. See you next Wednesday.